Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk to you about PHP Fig breaking the boundaries. Um, first, a couple of warnings. Um, one is that we have, we're having some problems with my power cable. Um, and my uh, MacBook currently has 3% battery. So if it suddenly my slides go off, um, I might have to do the rest of the presentation with no slides. Um, and the other thing is, is that I am slightly losing my voice as well. Um, so it could be quite an interesting uh, presentation. So uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, so firstly, who am I? Um, my name is Michael Cullen. I'm a Brit, um, and I was very proud to say that a few weeks ago. Um, and then we voted for Brexit. And uh, now I have many very British problems. Um, so, you know. Um, I work on, there's also my Twitter handle up there as well. I work on a project called PHVV. Who's heard of PHVV? Awesome, most of you. Um, who's actually used it in the past like three years? OK, fair enough. <laughs> Actually, was there a single hand up? Like, okay, Jeremy McCola. Oh, thank you very much. I know you're probably lying just to be nice. Yeah, okay. Um, I also uh, run a user group called PHP Surrey um, in the UK, and I am a secretary of the PHP Fig, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, but you don't give a crap about that. You're not here to see me. You're here to hear about the Fig. So. First, a little bit of a history lesson about the PHP community. Um, in 1994, 1994 was a really boring year. Um, not really much happened. Um, I apologize if any of you were born in 1994. Um, Nelson Mandela uh, was inaugurated president. That was quite a cool thing that happened. Um, that was a major worldwide event. That was probably the only important thing that happened that year, perhaps with the exception of China, I see what you mean about the clicker. Yeah, OK. Um, my clicker was having fun with Jeremy yesterday, and it's now having fun with me, it appears. Um, China got the internet. Um, obviously, they still don't have the internet in quite the same way that we do. Um, but they got the internet in 1994. And the only other thing that I could find that actually happened in 1994 was Harry Styles and Justin Bieber were born. Um, and the thing is, I wanted to make my slide look good, like with three things. So it just like his face just had to go in there. There was one very other important thing that happened in 1994, though. Does anyone know who this gentleman here is? Yeah, I just shouted out. Yes, I love, I love your style. Um, this gentleman is Rasmus Lerdoff, um, and in 1994, he started working on what was uh, then to become PHP. Um, he initially actually created it as a way to track visitors to his resume. Um, I don't really think he uh, quite saw the impact it was going to have on his resume um, in the long term, inventing PHP. Um, and ultimately, because of what happened in 1994 and has then gone on, we all have our jobs right now. So um, going forward to 1998, um, Zeev and Andy, um, Zeev, uh, that I forget the surname of actually, uh, uh, Zarowski, um, and Andy Gutmans, um, they were working, they were students at the time actually, and they were working on, uh, they were trying to create an e commerce cart, and they tried to uh, do some bits, and they found loads of bugs in PHP, um, as some of us still do. Um, and their solution to this was they had a look at the PHP engine. Um, and they thought it was awful. Um, so they turned around to their university professor and they said, could we have some extra credit if we like, actually work on PHP core? And they, he said yes. So then on uh, June 6, 1998, PHP 3 came out. Um, around this kind of time, phplib um, became a thing. Um, has anyone used phplib? You're very old. Um, <laughs> Um, phplib is uh, what is probably the first ever PHP framework. I've never used it. Um, I couldn't even find a download of the initial version when I was trying to research for this talk. Um, it was essentially the symphony of its day, but in 1998, as you can imagine, that looked a bit different. Um, in 1999, um, PHP went from having 100,000 websites to 350,000 websites uh, running PHP. Um, 
And that doesn't sound much today, but to them, that was, that was amazing. This was, this was, this was groundbreaking. This, they, they were like, actually, PHP is becoming a thing. Um, I mean, 350,000 is not a big number compared to the tens of millions of websites that we have today. But for them, this was, this was, this was PHP starting to become a thing. And people started writing books about it. Um, this is the very first PHP book um, that was written in 1999. Um, I think there have been a couple of editions since, and I apologize for the very blurry image. Um, I, again, couldn't find an original copy. Um, if anyone has one, actually. I don't know if uh, Benjamin over there, seeing as you were using PHP Live, you know. Uh, um. <laughs> In 1999-2000, uh, there was also the first ever PHP conference called PHP Congress. Um, you'll notice that it's a PHP Congress, not the United States Congress. Um, and this was, this was the beginnings of a community starting to form around the language. Um, that people were coming together and people were discussing PHP, not just um, as something to create their home pages or track visitors to their resume, um, but something to create carts, something that they could actually work on in their free time and spare time, but in their professions as well. Um, there was also something called the PHP Extension and Application Repository. Now, does anyone actually know what this is? Because I, I suspect most of you know what it is just only by its acronym. Pair, yeah, exactly. So Pair, um, for any of you who haven't used it, was essentially um, a framework and distribution system uh, for reusable PHP components. Sounds quite similar, doesn't it? Um, it had a number of flaws um, in the ways that it distributed and the ways that it resolved dependencies, um, in that it basically didn't. Um, and it, would do, and it worked more on a, a system level than an application level. But the fact is, is that this was, again, a way that we were starting to come towards uh, being able to share things and being able to distribute packages. Um, as a general interesting thing, I saw this tweet, uh, I think it was yesterday, um, by Davy Shafik. He's the PHP 7.1 release manager about uh, removing an RFC to remove pair from PHP 8. Um, and yes, we are already talking about PHP 8, apparently. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting, just the way that the voting had gone with yay, um, with 173 votes. So maybe pair is to be no longer. Um, but an interesting piece of PHP history. If we then go forward to 2000, um, then Andy Gutmans and uh, Zeev um, were working on rewriting the engine that powered PHP. Um, and if, uh, for any of you who don't know, Zend is the company that they both founded together. And it's actually the name. Uh, ZE is from Zeev's name, and ND is the end of Andy's name, hence the name Zend. Um, and they created this company to be the PHP company, but they created the Zend engine, which was significantly more important, in my personal opinion, at least, anyway. Um, and they released PHP 4 with this. Um, now, PHP 7, we, we all went, wow. Performance increase in PHP 7 was huge, right? I mean, in some benchmarks, it could perform up to seven times faster. Um, now, in the early benchmarks for this, which, again, were in a very limited uh, scope, um, sometimes the Zend engine could perform up to 100 times faster than PHP 3. Um, just, just think about that in terms of scale, 100 times faster. Um, so the Zend engine really has made PHP from a nice little academic tool that you can use your personal homepage and tracking visitors to your resume to something which we can have uh, huge applications like Drupal or Magento, um, even if they do sometimes uh, are a little bit slow. Around 1999, 2000, projects like PHP, um, PHP Nuke started, um, started up. Uh, I mentioned PHPV because uh, obviously I'm a PHP management team member. Um, but PHP Nuke, uh, I think, is still around, actually. I, I'm not sure if it's under any active development, but I mean, you can still go out and download it. Um, but small little projects, open source projects, started to pop up and people started to reuse them. Um, and then as time went on, more and more projects came out. So, I mean, you've got Drupal that came out around 2000, um, WordPress 2003. Um, Symphony and Joomla both came out in 2005, um, and Zen Framework came out in 2006. So there were lots and lots and lots of projects starting up, uh, reusable projects, projects that you could go and install yourself. Um, you could go and have a PHP reinstallation, you could go and have a Drupal installation. And that, that worked well for a little while. Um, you know, you could go off and you could have your forum or you could have your content management system. It became a little bit more complex when you wanted to integrate these things. Especially seeing as 
each of these projects seem to develop its own ecosystem. Now, I mean, all of these are modern projects, actually, at the moment. So because I wasn't, I wasn't a PHP developer back in 2001. Um, but you know, you've got a sort of Symfony ecosystem. You've got, and around that, you've got companies associated with Symfony. You've got obviously Sensia Labs, but you've got others like KMP Labs. You've got a whole series of projects um, that are quite commonly associated with Symfony, like Doctrine or Monologue, um, Friends of Symfony, Bund uh, Friends of Symfony who produce bundles, uh, Sonata. All of all of these different uh, projects that exist within the Symfony ecosystem, essentially. In the same way, you know, you've got Laravel there. Um, Laravel is sometimes considered to be within the Symfony ecosystem. Sometimes it's considered part of the PHP ecosystem, and sometimes they're um, proud to uh, say that they are not part of any. Um, but I mean, you know, you've got Blade, which is their templating engine, Lumen, which is their micro framework, and then the main Laravel framework. I'm, I'm not going to go through everything on there, but the fact is, is that WordPress, uh, Drupal, um, Zen Framework, they all have their own little ecosystems. And ultimately, that's great, because within those ecosystems, you can share knowledge, you can share code, you can share people, even. But it doesn't promote something healthy between those ecosystems. It means that your, and the more subdivided that a community becomes, the less interaction between those, between those sub communities within the larger PHP community. Because every, every project up on here is part of the PHP community. But the fact is, is that if you associate yourself more with a sub-community than the overall community, then, that's a, then you're not forming those bridges between those ecosystems. You also have different locales, so um, locals. So you have the Symphony Barcelona community, which is, as I can see, a very thriving community. Um, I think you have something like 100 people at your meetups. I'm looking for Mark, but I can't see him. 100 people at your meetups. Um, PHP London is very similar. Um, Symphony Developers UK, I think, alone gets about 80 people per meetup. Um, I run a PHP user group, PHP Surrey. Um, coming from the UK, actually, I'm very lucky to have lots and lots of little user groups um, because of our densely populated um, and the fact that nobody likes traveling. Within one hour of my house, I can go to about five or six different user groups, which is an absolutely amazing thing uh, to have. Um, it's something not people in the States have. Um, I think Ryan said yesterday on the Sound of Symphony podcast that he had uh, one or two within sort of a few a few hours from his uh, from his house. And again, it's these little sub communities, um, but it's all about. But then ultimately, um, it's about there are not really many links between those communities. There's no central coordination of PHP user groups. There's no central coordination or collaboration between these different frameworks, these different projects. Also, there was a lack of dependency management until quite recently in PHP, uh, in, uh, in PHP. and there was no primary package repository. Um, you could talk a little bit about um, uh, pair and PHP classes, which I'll talk about in a minute, but they didn't serve quite the same purpose as packages. Without that, um, that ease of use, um, it didn't really serve the kind of purpose that it needed to serve. Um, so it made it hard to include libraries. Um, PHP um, didn't have namespaces. So for example, with, uh, I remember with PHP and Joomla, we used to both have a function called, function called session underscore start. Um, and we both also used to have a global variable called user. Now, if you're trying to include any code from the two of them within the other, that causes huge conflicts, just simply from the fact that everything is in the global scope. And we didn't even prefix functions with um, the vendor name or the project name. We just simply like, hey, here's a function, and this describes what it does. Um, and that made it really hard for projects to be interoperable to use them together. PHP classes. Um, who's used something from PHP classes in their career or in their hobby time? A few of you. Um, a few of you look more sheepish about it than others. Um, PHP classes served a great purpose. Um, it served as a way to, for people to publish uh, reusable little libraries and scripts. Um, that's about as far as compliments go with PHP classes. Because ultimately, a lot of the code on there that you found was uh, not of a great quality. Um, I think it still exists, actually. You can probably still grab code from there, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it was generally sub-quality. Um, you had no real way of uh, handling any dependency management. You would literally just go onto PHP classes, click a download button, and grab a copy of the file, stick it in your PHP project, and away you go. 
Um, that doesn't allow for proper release cycles, updates, getting security updates if they realize that there are security issues, and there are plenty of them. So PHP had different packages, and each of those had their own ecosystems. They even had their own conferences. We still do. This is a Symfony conference. Um, and all of that leads to a divided community. Now, this is not a bad thing. A divided community is not a bad thing. Having Symfony conferences, Symfony meetups, Laravel meetups, Laravel conferences, Drupal conferences, um, PHP uh, conferences, which we have had, um, that's not a bad thing. That, that allows room for people who are working in a specialist field, like in Symfony, to get that specialist uh, information and knowledge and talks, and um, talks that might not be appropriate um, in a wider PHP conference. But, um, it does kind of lead to um, this uh, scenario which a friend of mine, Larry Garfield, described um, and made the term popular of getting off the island. Each of these different uh, ecosystems and projects could be described as its own island. So WordPress is an island. Um, it's a very nice island, actually. I wouldn't mind that being my island. Um, PHV being an island, Joomla being an island, Symfony being an island. But also organizations can be their own islands too. Google, um, you know, they have plenty of open source projects. They're also an island. And ultimately, you're your own island as well. If you're producing your own projects um, and releasing them as open source uh, bundles, then you are your own island. You're creating your own stuff. And that's kind of fine um, in some occasions. It's OK being your own island. Um, we, we, we like running our own islands. And that's kind of why we do it. Um, most people used to do PHP for fun. That's how PHP came about. Um, PHP used to be, is, um, as Anthony Ferrara describes it, uh, it's a language built on needs, um, not on computer science uh, concepts that you might learn at university. It, it, as um, people are things that are added to the language, not because it should be added to the language, but because that was what was needed for the language, to be able to go in the direction that it wanted to go. It's not a language for large-scale sites like Facebook. It's not a language for small-scale sites like your little blog that you've just whipped up in half an hour. It's a site for everything. It's a, it's a bit of a polyglot kind of thing for web applications. And a lot of people just, saw, you know, that was, that, was, that was fine. You can be your own island. You, people enjoyed going and writing and rolling their own. Because you know that's how you explore the language. Um, I've written a blog system before. Um, I have not open sourced it and never intend to, um, especially considering how many years ago I wrote it. But the fact is, is that it was fine rolling my own. I didn't want to go and run WordPress. I wanted to just have a little play with PHP and create something for fun. But more recently, actually, we've been breaking the mold. We've come to realize that with one brain, one person, one ecosystem. You can come up with so many amazing thoughts. Um, you can come up with so many bright ideas. Think about what Fabian has done to the PHP community just as one individual. He has brought computer science context, so concepts from other languages, um, dependency injection containers, event dispatches, that weren't very prominent in the PHP community, perhaps until Symfony started implementing them. Um, and, that, and, that's, and, that, and in the same way, lots of other things are coming from other languages, like asynchronous programming as well. So one mind can do a lot. Two minds, you would think, can do, you know, you can just have double, right? Um, if you've got two people working on a project, you've got double the manpower, you can do it in double the time, or you can do double the work, whatever. But that, I would say that's not true. I would say with two minds, you can achieve so much more than just the sum of your parts. You can bounce ideas off of each other. If you've got Drupal and you've got PHP and we're both looking at things like permissions management, for example, we might have solved completely different problems that actually might affect us in the future or might be more extensible. Um, Drupal and PHP both are very different applications, but ultimately, the core of a permission system, of a security system, is ultimately the same. And if you're working together, then you can not just produce something that works for PHP or works for Drupal, but something that works for everyone, something that works for your cart that you've just gone to have and go develop your blog system or you know, whatever your specific need is. And then you start to get towards a component system, a set of libraries, like a security component, maybe. People often talk about reinventing the wheel. Um, and it's interesting, if you have a lots of different wheels. So let's say you have a square wheel, you have an octagonal wheel, 
and you have a decagonal wheel. So one has 10 sides, one has eight, one has five. You'll notice that there is a difference between those wheels. You'll notice that the five-sided wheel is not as good as the eight-sided wheel, which is not as good as the 10-sided wheel. So you've got a bunch of different wheels there, um, and you can see the difference between them, and you can see that it actually, the more sides that a wheel has, the better it is. And you can see that it's tending towards having a one-sided wheel or an infinite number of sided wheels. So essentially a circle. So you get to that point by trying lots of different things and then combining it. But then once you've found something that works, instead of reinventing the wheel, you can develop that wheel. Instead of having a bunch of different stone wheels, you can develop it. You can have work out that you can use spokes instead of just having it solid, and then it reduces the weight of it. And that's really what this becomes about. You, it's fine having different projects, having different ways of doing things, but if you can then bring people together and work together, then you can see what works and what doesn't, and you can combine those ideas and produce something that you can then develop and take so much further than you ever would having just reinventing it every time. So what, 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 what's changed in the PHP community? I've mentioned that some of these things have changed. Um, one of them is object-oriented programming. I think this has been revolutionary, revolutionary for the PHP community. Um, if you don't use object-oriented programming, that's perfectly fine. You should, that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't be forced to use object-oriented programming, and I disagree when people say that you are a bad developer if you don't. Because ultimately, you do what you need to do. If you're a developer and you're just coming in and you're just having a little play with a script, then ultimately, you don't need to use object-oriented programming. That's something that's completely out of scale and that you don't need to do. There's no point requiring you to do that. And the reason that PHP is the language that powers 80% of the internet is because it is so easy to pick up the initial bits. It's also well known for a language that has lots of bad code out there because a lot of inexperienced developers work with PHP. But that's fine as well. Like, you shouldn't judge people just because they only do the amount of PHP that they need to. Um, yes, sometimes when projects start to scale, then you might want to do things differently. But the fact is, is that you shouldn't judge small-scale projects and developers who don't have a huge need to do object-oriented programming for not doing it. But object-oriented programming has introduced classes. It's introduced namespacing. And this allows us to get rid of things like locals. It's allowed us to do proper unit testing, for example. It's allowed us to have a Joomla project and a PHPRB project working together in the same code base without conflicting, because you don't have two classes that are named for the same thing. You don't have two functions or variables named for the same thing. Another huge change uh, is Composer. Um, who's not used Composer out of interest? Fantastic. I mean, you've all used Symfony, or most of you have used Symfony, I presume, so um, you would have used Composer in that. Composer has changed dramatically, and I'm not going to harp on about it because you know, you know what it is. But Composer was, at, so Composer was initially developed for PHP BB, interestingly enough, and not many people know the history of this. It was developed by, uh, initially, uh, the concept by Niels Adaman, um, who was the lead developer of PHP BB until quite recently. Um, for PHP 3.1, we needed a dependency management system, um, a dependency resolution system for extensions in 3.1. Um, so he was like, right, well, I should build this thing. Um, and he mentioned this to Geordie and Fabian at a Symphony Live or Symphony Day um, a number of years ago. And uh, Fabian was like, well, actually, we've kind of got this problem in Symphony as well. We're currently using this horrible depths thing. Um, and something proper like Composer would allow us to use libraries properly. It would allow us to bring things like Monologue in without this horrible depths file. So Geordi uh, joined the team with Niels. Um, Geordi's now essentially the lead developer of Composer, um, and Niels a step back. But So that initial six months of Composer being worked on, um, including the writing of a SAT solver, if any of you um, are computer science grads, um, then that was all funded by PHP B, um, and initially written for us, and then made to be a multiple purpose thing. And that's allowed us to include all of those libraries in a way that works. It's allowed us to overcome those problems I mentioned with PHP classes and um, uh, pair. And the other part of that is Packagist, which comes along with it. This is the logo for Packagist I discovered. Um, Packages has provided a centralized repository that works well with uh, um, that works well with 
Composer. It's designed for Composer. But it's also provided a way that people can publish their libraries, as opposed to just it being a thing on GitHub that nobody's ever going to find. And then finally, um, of course, I am not going to go without mentioning the fig. Um, PHP fig has had a huge impact on the rest, uh, on being able to standardize things like autoloaders, PSR zero, for, for example. So in PHP tech, um, uh, a number of years ago, this is where this is where it all started. Um, it was a gathering together of many projects, and this was back in 2009. So actually, the PHP Tech logo looked a bit more like this. Um, I couldn't find an accurate one. Um, and it was essentially a bunch of uh, guys going, getting around a table um, at PHP Tech um, to have a chat. It was, I think, it was uh, an April or May. Um, off the top of my head. Um, so just before 5.3. And all of these people, they came around the table. Um, so you've got representatives from Zen Framework, Symphony Framework. Um, I believe Stefan was community manager at the time. Cal Evans, uh, you had two representatives from Pear. You had a representative from Fing, Aura, um, Agavi. Ag Agavi. Um, all of these people came together, and they were like, well, how can we work together to make auto-loading work for all of us? Because it, it makes sense to try and standardize this thing, right? So they created this autoloader, um, which I suspect most of you in this room have used, even if you don't know it, PSR zero. And then they thought, hey, this is, this is cool. We're, we're, we're working together. This, this has never happened before. Like, this, this is something new. Um, could, could, could we do this for other things? Could we, could we standardize more than just an autoloader? Could we, could we have a group of the project leads of different large projects coming together more often at conferences and having a chat about stuff and seeing if we can find more commonalities, like maybe coding guidelines. Um, so coding guidelines um, formed PSR1, PSR2 um, a little while after. Um, and this involved, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of it was taken from Pair. Um, but all the different member projects at that point were surveyed. Um, and then they essentially just tried to um, concatenate that all into one uh, specification, uh, or two as it ended up being. Um, PSR1 actually does affect interoperability. There's a common thing that people say that PSR1, PSR2, it's just about tabs and spaces. It's not. The, diff the reason it was split between PSR1 and PSR2 is that things in PSR1 are deemed to affect interoperability between projects. So that's why you'll notice that most projects do support PSR1, even if they don't claim it, um, whereas there are less projects that support PSR2. PSR2 is more about how your code looks and things like tabs, spaces. Um, so that's the primary difference between PSR1 and 2. Um, and it's certainly worth, if you uh, are looking at being interoperable with other projects, even if you don't like tab spaces, et cetera, have a look at PSR1, because that's kind of things like um, don't include side effects in the same files as your classes. So don't have an any set or an echo, for example. Then we have PSR3. Um, PSR3 was monologue working with some other lo logging libraries. Um, I've just got a brief example up there um, of just two methods. It's a one interface, a logging interface, and some exception handlers, um, some ex exception uh, interfaces. Um, it's very simple. It's just designed as a simple way so that you don't have to rely on an individual logging library. So you can rely on the abstracted concept of different types of log level. Um, and it also defined those different types of log level from an IETF specification on logging. Doc blocks. Uh, who uses doc blocks? Almost everyone in this room, I, I, um, uh, I can see. So again, that's something we can standardize, because actually, things like app param are pretty standard. But when it comes to things like uh, app parent and things like that, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And that can be problematic when you've got API genera uh, documentation generators, um, things that pass that data, and they put it into a format. Um, and this was worked on by a huge number of people. Um, I recently merged a pull request um, of uh, PSR5. Um, and this was the participant thing in the little right-hand corner. Um, huge number of different projects involved, because it affects so many people. Um, it was being led by uh, Mike Van Riel, um, who's a PHP documenter. PSR6, caching. Um, as I've got some examples up here again, um, courtesy of Jeremy McCullough. Um, 
So it has a cache pool interface and a cache item interface. The idea of um, these two uh, interfaces is the cache pool, for example, might represent Reddit, whereas the cache item might represent a specific item in that cache. So um, here we're seeing if, uh, from the cache pool if there is an item um, with that particular key, um, and that will return a Boolean. We can also get an item from the cache pool. So we can get Jeremy's status right now, and that will return a cache item. Um, we can then get uh, the result of that uh, cache item. Um, and apparently, he's working on his slides. Are you working on your slides, Jeremy? Yes, you are working on your slides. Oh, funny that. Um, I obviously uh, had the foresight to know that you would be in this talk. Uh, Jeremy's speaking next, by the way. Um, but let's change Jeremy's status. We can set the value of uh, that particular cache item. We can set him to panicking. Jeremy, are you now panicking? Oh, you're, yeah, OK, fair enough. Um, but he will be done in an hour, so we'll set this to expire in an hour, right? Because you won't be panicking then. And then finally, we can just save the status of Jeremy McCullough to our uh, cache pool. PSR7. Um, this probably has had more impact on uh, interoperability than anything else in the past few years. Um, PSR7 is huge, or at least it might be one day. PSR7 is all about HTTP messages. So you've got a message interface, um, and then you've got the two core types of an HTTP message. You've got uh, types. You've got a request, and you've got a response, right? Um, and it just defines a series of methods um, as to how PSR7 works. Um, and you've got a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on there as well. But standardizing HTTP messages has allowed um, things to be passed between applications, frameworks. Um, it's provided a, a, a pavement, essentially, for middlewares to be able to interact with this kind of thing. Um, the lead on this was uh, the Zen framework lead, Matthew Wirofini. Um, and there were other people working on it, like Bo Simonson, um, who uh, was working on something called Stack PHP. Has anyone heard of Stack PHP out of interest? A few of you, yeah. So that's, um, they, I think they work with middlewares and stuff like that. Um, PSR8, hugging PSR. Uh, Ryan, could you join me up on stage very briefly? Right, so uh, how this works, um, this, is, this was a very important PSR that came out a little while back. Um, so what happens is it's just got one method in it. Um, it's a huggable interface. Um, so Ryan, are you huggable? Uh, I implement huggable interface. I, I also implement huggable. So um, uh, Mathias, could you please tell me to hug Ryan? Okay. No, 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 no. Read the doc. Oh, okay, actually, no, no, no. Right. So I hug you, Mathias. No, no, no. Don't hug me back yet. Right, Mathias. Could you now tell Ryan to hug me back? Oh. Okay. Now we are having a hug, and that's that's how this PSR works. Yeah. You can sit down. Thank you very much. Give him a, give him a round of applause for that. Thank you, Ryan. Um, the PSR8 huggable interface uh, is an April Fool. Um, it was uh, Larry Garfield um, put it through on the 1st of April a few years ago. Um, and it is, uh, actually, it's a, it's a source of contention because some people say that the joke has gone a bit too far. Um, so we're currently looking at ways in which we can now move. The, so I mean, it's in theory still a draft PSR. We're looking at ways that we can take that further and say that actually um, this PSR was a joke. Can we not have it as a serious thing anymore? Security. Security is really important, right? Um, who, who thinks security is not important? OK, Magnus, um, uh, you're probably never going to be hired again after <laughs> that particular hand raising. Um, there are two PSRs that are currently in the works for security, um, PSR 9 and PSR 10. Um, PSR 10 is all about the security disclosure process. So if I find a, Symphony, a um, security issue in Symphony, um, then the PSR 10 would detail how I should go about reporting that in a, in a proper way. So, for example, um, if it was well, if it's an, if, an issue in Drupal, for example, um, then a bad way of me reporting that would be me submitting a form on Drupal.com, uh, on Drupal.org, as I think the website is, um, because the idea is that that form could be compromised. So, sending an email address that is uh, PGP. Um, uh, uh, assigned to uh, security at drupal.org uh, would be a good way of handling that, for example. Um, that's not the contents of the spec. Um, but it's all about some responsible disclosure. And if they don't then do anything about it after a certain amount of time, then tell the world. Um, 
because ultimately, if they're not going to fix it, then the most responsible thing you can do is inform people that it exists before someone else does. And PSR 9, um, who uses Sensio Lab security checker? Ah, a few of you. Who's not heard of Sensio Lab security checker? Okay, Fab, a few of you. Um, so the Security Lab security checker is a little script that you can run on your composer.lock. Um, and what that will do is it will tell you if any of the versions in your composer.lock have security vulnerabilities reported. Um, it's a great way to just double check that you're um, uh, not running any accidentally out, out, uh, outdated dependencies that are vulnerable to security issues. It's definitely worth checking out if you've not heard of it before. Um, so this is a way of standardizing the format on your own website of uh, how to report those vulnerabilities. So for example, having them at uh, drupal.org slash security advisories, and then having like a CVE code or something, and then having a YAML file or an XML file um, that details information of those vulnerabilities that tools like Sensio Lab Security Checker um, might be able to then scan that and pass that file um, and handle that. Um, and that's actually now being led by Michael Hess, who is the Drupal security lead. Um, but formerly, it was the editor of that was our very own Lucas Quay. I don't know how to say his. K, K, Quay? K? Smith? L anyway, Lucas Smith, I'll uh, uh, go with that. Um, PSR 11 container interface, um, tiny, um, has two methods at the moment. Um, obviously, it's not finalized. Um, the idea of this is that it will just simply, so you could get, and then you would just put in the key for the, um, the uh, service you want, or see if it has it. Now, they put this for an entrance vote, and then they're like, actually, why are we standardizing this? Like, how often do you have multiple containers in your application? Wouldn't it make more sense to standardize con uh, container service definitions? So this is something that they're actually working on at the moment is a way to standardize the way that you're defining your services. So that's kind of like your services.yaml, uh, or the loading of that, at least. Um, I don't know the exact details on that myself, personally. Um, but if you have a look at uh, GitHub slash uh, container dash interop, um, they've got all of their different stuff on there. Um, and the idea is, is that they're working on that at the moment, and then they'll bring that back into the figures of PSR. Um, maybe PSR 11, uh, or they might uh, split it off into a new PSR and uh, be PSR, I don't know, 51 whatever number on by then. Hyperlinks, it sounds really stupid, um, but being able to pass URI objects between Drupal, PHP, Symfony, et cetera, is kind of a useful thing. Um, so this is actually being led by one of the Drupal folks, Larry Garfield, um, useful PSR. Um, event management, um, and I don't mean this kind of event management. Um, I mean as in an event dispatcher. Um, so uh, that's something work being worked on by Brian at the moment. He's current, uh, Brian Retter, uh, or Chuck Reeves, actually. No, Chuck Reeves, sorry. Um, and uh, Brian Retter is the coordinator, I believe, so I'm not entirely wrong. Um, that's being worked on at the moment. He's forming a working group, and that will likely include people from Symfony, people from Zen, to try and see how we can find commonalities between that so that your event dispatcher can, uh, again, be interoperable between them. Um, PSR 15 is an HTTP middleware. This is very, very new. Um, a middleware is essentially, it, who's not used a middleware before? Or who has used a middleware, rather? Okay, so most of you haven't. Um, a middleware is uh, essentially a way, if you've got um, an HTTP request and it's being been created, um, and it's about being able to modify that before it reaches uh, um, the client, essentially. Um, being able to modify that in, in certain ways, and that's that's a middleware. And this is a way of trying to standardize how you can interact with those middlewares. Um, and then from that, we realized that PSR 17 HTTP factories was a useful thing, how you actually create those PSR 7 HTTP messages, um, object, message objects. So that's a lot of stuff, right? Um, all the things, and there's like more, but we could go on. Uh, there's talk of a console uh, PSR, which will be basically a PSR7 for console applications instead of HTTP applications. That would be kind of cool, right? A um, whole load of async stuff, promises, event loop. Um, storage, persisting stuff to um, uh, a file system. Um, but it doesn't have to just be PSRs that we're working on. Ultimately, we're, we're a group of PHP projects, right? Um, and we came together because we wanted to collaborate on things. So one of the things that was uh, discussed a while back was something, does uh, anyone remember Go PHP 5? 
Okay, GoPHP 5 was um, an initiative to try and get people to upgrade to PHP 5. It was a collaboration between projects that said they were going to bump up their minimum version, and web hosts that said, we will, bump, uh, we will bump up our installed version at the same time, so that nobody gained a competitive advantage over anyone else, but we all managed to better ourselves. That was probably a really good example of the PHP community working together at a very, very early time. Um, and just for Jeremy, there's a non-breaking space in there as well. Updates. So we don't just bring out new PSRs. Um, there are updates to PSRs as well. PSR 12 is an update to the coding style, um, PSR 2. Uh, PSR uh, 4 uh, was an update to PSR 0. You can extend PSRs. Um, so I suppose PSR 15 and PSR uh, 17, factories and middlewares, are extensions of PSR 7 in some respects. Um, PSR 2 is an extension of PSR 1. It includes stuff that PSR 1 doesn't, but still reliant on it. And you can have alternative PSRs. So if you don't like a PSR, um, you can come in and introduce an alternative if there's a valid reason for it. So PSR 16 is a cache PSR. PSR 6, which is the um, cache PSR that already exists that I um, was taking the, um, I was making fun of Jeremy with, um, that's a much more complicated uh, cache PSR um, that involves a pool and cache items and whatnot. Um, simple cache is designed to be a lot more simple. Um, it's currently being worked on by Geordi, um, the composer guy, uh, Paul Draconis, and uh, Fabian is, also, uh, the, is the sponsor on that. And uh, there is also talk of potentially having a more asynchronous, friendly version of PSR 7. We don't have to replace PSRs. We can provide an alternative if there's a valid reason for having two different standards and they're not going to accidentally compete. So I, I've talked a lot um, about stuff the, PSR, uh, the PHP fig has done. I've talked a lot about how the PHP fig came about. But like, what actually is it? Like, I haven't actually said what is the PHP fig. And there's kind of debate about this. Um, but I think one thing we can liken it to is the PHP Congress. Um, I'm sorry this image took a lot of time. Um, so Frank De Jong, um, he is a friend of mine, and he actually put this image together. And there's like a PHP thing there. There's a PHP there. And then it says, in PHP we trust, instead of in God we trust. Um, he spent a lot of time on it, so I thought I'd include it twice. Um, PHP Congress, it's kind of like a bunch of people coming together to make laws for the PHP community, except for the fact that they're not laws, um, but we debate things, and then we come to conclusions on things, we vote on things, and we produce what is essentially legislation, it's just not mandatory. Other people call us the United Nations of PHP. We're a bunch of different projects that come together to try and work together on things. And it doesn't have to just be on creating standards or legislation. It can be on wider things. The UN Security Council doesn't produce legislation as such, but it still collaborates on things um, so that they can come out with common aims. Again, you know, they have a voting system. So essentially, it's just a way of trying to um, a bunch of people working together towards a common aims. Uh, PHP Fig, um, not everyone knows what it stands for. So PHP Framework Interoperability Group. It's kind of lost its meaning a bit. Um, that initial meeting used to be was a bunch of frameworks, so it made sense then, right? Um, now we've uh, actually seen that to be properly interoperable and to consider everyone's interests, you need to have libraries and you need to have packages. So Monolog, uh, Jackalope, Aesthetic. Um, or Drupal PHP to actually be able to achieve interoperability across the whole PHP ecosystem. And we produce PHP standard recommendations. As I said, these are not laws that you have to follow. They are the specifications, if you follow them, then there are certain restrictions, like you'll say you must do this, you must do this to be able to be compliant with that specification. But you don't have to follow them. You can do what you like. We're not telling you what to do. We're giving you something that you can say that you're compliant with. We're giving you the opportunity to have a standardized interface that a bunch of people who I hope know what they're doing um, have worked together on this specification, and you can then say that you support that. And hopefully, we can get to somewhere with it's interoperable or the like. Because all of this is eventually going towards interoperability. Um, not everything concerns interoperability. PSR 2, uh, which is coding style, PSR 9, 10, the security ones, and PSR 12, the second coding style one, don't affect interoperability. Um, but PSR, and I'm going to have to read this list off if you apologize, 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, do all affect interoperability. Um, they're all things that actually make a difference. And they allow applications to be able to work together. But it only works if people use it, right? So PSR 3. 
uh, logger interface. Monolog uses it. Um, I presume that's the one most of you are probably most familiar with. Um, Analog um, and Klogger, apparently both logging uh, libraries that use PSR3. Um, so you could just switch them out if you in your Symfony application. Um, Symfony uh, and other um, applications like uh, Drupal, etc. They just say I want a PSR3 logger. They don't say I want Monolog. PSR6 um, cache interface. Um, PHP cache um, was probably one of the first adopters of this. I was actually, it was created by two friends of mine um, in uh, uh, SymphonyCon Berlin. Uh, one of them is this guy up here uh, who's sitting in the front row. So if you want to have a chat with, uh, about PHP cache, then come and have a chat with him. Um, and he's doing a lightning talk uh, at the end of the day as well. Um, there's also Stash, which is a well-known li um, caching library. And Symphony, as of the new uh, uh, caching component, um, which I imagine that if any of you go to SymphonyCon or Symphony Lives later on this year, you'll hear a lot about. Um, but there is an article on Symphony blog about it. And then PSR7, um, HTTP message. This is an interesting one. So Slim supports it. Slim is very much a middleware friendly, um, I think is a nice way of describing it, framework. Um, Zen Framework, um, as I said, the editor of uh, Zen Framework was the lead of Zen Framework, uh, Matthew Werifini. Uh Laravel has a bridge for PSR7. Symphony also has a bridge for PSR7, although it's not supported in the core um, for various reasons. Um, Drupal also has a bridge. And so do loads of other projects. Uh, PHPV can throw a bridge. Joomla can throw a bridge. Uh, uh, actually, I think Joomla can roar. Um, Stack PHP, Cake PHP, Aura, Solar. Um, all of these projects can actually support PSR, whether it's with a bridge or not. So you can have an HTTP message and, th and pass it through all of these different frameworks and applications without too much hassle. PSR 1 and 2, like lots of people use PSR 1 and 2. I, yesterday I was uh, sitting down with um, a bunch of guys and I just said, can you just uh, shout out names of PHP projects to me um, so I can come up with this list of PSR 1 and 2 uh, compliant libraries? Because the fact is, is that almost every single PHP library now is using PSR 1 and 2. Because who wants to actually spend time defining their own coding style when there's just one out there that you can just say you use? And it has things like PHP uh, coding style um, detectors and whatnot for built in and support into IDEs. And then PSR zero, well, um, uh, anyone who's used Composer, um, you've probably uh, used PSR zero or PSR four. Um, and uh, Packagist, um, as of 2.24 today, has 103,929 packages on it. And I would wage that the vast majority of those uh, use PSR 0 or PSR 4. So that's a lot of packages. I don't expect any of you to read this. It's quite, probably quite hard to see, especially from the back. Um, everything green up there is support of a PSR um, by a particular project. I just did a shout out on Twitter, and I said, can you let me know what PSRs you support? And this is the response I got. Um, anything white means that it's not applicable or that they haven't filled it in yet. Um, anything red means that they could support it. It's something that works in the context of their application, um, but it doesn't. Uh, anything, uh, it, um, but they're not supporting it yet, or they don't have any intentions to. So there's a lot of green out there, right? The PHP fig is formed of a whole load of projects. Um, this is just a small number of them. Um, because ultimately, that's what the PHP fig is still all about right now. It's about a bunch of projects coming and working together. Um, but there's a little bit more to it than that, because a project can't communicate, right? So we have lots and lots of people. And to be involved with a fig, you don't have to be a member project. You've got a whole load of different people, all from those different ecosystems I was talking about earlier, working together. You've got Larry Garfield up there in the top left-hand cor corner with, from the Drupal community. You've got Matthew Wirofini from Zend. You've got Taylor Otwell from Laravel. You've got Fabian from Symphony. You've got Chris Pitt from Silverstripe um, and some async stuff. Um, You've got Bernard, who was here earlier on the bottom row. Um, you've got, uh, so I mean, and the thing is, you don't have to be a member project. So you've got Chuck Reeves up there. He's an editor of a PSR. Um, and you don't have to be a member project to be involved with the fig. But the fact is, is that we have a lot of member projects because they were, um, ultimately they're the core bulk um, of PHP applications that are out there at the moment. In the history of the fig, there have been 58 projects that have been member projects. That's a large number of projects. There have been 70 representatives for those 50 projects. 
there have been four secretaries, uh, 16 PSR editors, 35 working group members for those PSRs, 1,374 pull requests, 15,000 mailing list posts, 3,161 people who are just subscribed to the mailing list, and that's not including people who have subscribed in the past and unsubscribed um, for reasons of their own. Uh, I can see a few people grinning at me. Um, 12 posts, roughly, to the mailing list every day. Obviously, that's, not, that's an average. 50 topics a month. And people say that a lot of that is your own inter internal discussions, right? But 97% of those posts on that mailing list are technical. 97%. So those of you that think that all we talk about is drama or membership requests, um, I think that kind of speaks for itself. We used to be proud of 350,000 PHP installs, but now we have millions of PHP installs. Um, and I was doing some number crunching, and I, fa I discovered that 10% of all websites on the internet are by projects that are either a member of the FIG or use PSRs. 10% of the internet, that's a cool number, right? 80% of the internet is powered by PHP. Uh, could you all do me a favor? Um, I know some of you have a laptop, so don't worry if you're, you've got your laptop out or whatever. Um, if you are able, could you please stand up for me? Right, so um, it's, it's only quick. I, I, I am, I'm interested to see what I like get as a result from this. Um, could you please uh, sit down if you're not a developer? Ah, good. Um, who uses a PSR on a library that you are a maintainer of? So if you have your own uh, library like PHP Cache or if you're on the Symfony core team or something like that, could you please sit down? That can be a project that's an open source project you use for work as well. OK. Um, could you please sit down if you've contributed to Symfony? Even if it's just like a typo or a bug fix or something like that. That's an awesome number. Ryan is grinning in the front row at that number of people who just sat down. Um, could you also please sit down if you've ever contributed to Drupal, Joomla, PHP, Zen Framework, Slim, Laravel, and by that I don't just mean in terms of you've worked on their GitHub repo and sent a pull request, but you know, you've worked on maybe a part of their documentation, or you've worked on something that involves code in that project. Okay, and now could you please sit down if you've ever put anything uh, that is object orientated um, on uh, Composer, or you've written a Composer.json and you've used an autoloader that's PSR0 or PSR4. Okay, so I th uh, the rest of you can sit down. Thank you very much. Um, every single person who is sitting down has used a PSR. A PSR has affected almost every single person in this room in your career. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing, right? 2009, uh, and uh, the FIG was started. 2008, none of these things existed. We didn't have Composer. We didn't have the FIG. And we were all a, um, a series of individual developers just doing our own thing. And where we've come to is a stage where we can produce specifications and standards that I can speak to an entire room, and almost every single person in the room has had interaction or benefited from a PSR. That's cool, right? It's a long way to come. Yeah. <laughs> Together, we can do a much better job, and ultimately, that's what the fig is all about. WordPress, when I, when, I first started, uh, when I first did the abstract for this talk, um, I was having a chat with WordPress about potentially joining the FIG. Um, some stuff has happened since, um, relating to the FIG, not discussion, so they're kind of on hold at the moment. Um, but WordPress has been one of those organizations that's traditionally seen as on the outskirts of the PHP community. It's a bit more detached. Um, PHP has a similar image, um, Joomla, for example. Um, but about 
that you can bring these projects in. Um, if, if WordPress, uh, so WordPress is predicted to power 26% of the internet, that's huge. Um, if WordPress joined the fig, um, then 36% of the internet would be by projects that are a member of the fig, 36%. Um, uh, now, that doesn't sound like a large percentage, but when you consider that the entire population of the United States and Europe combined is only 15% of our world's population, like, 36% is a large percentage. It's a huge percentage. Um, and, you know, bringing WordPress on board would be a great thing. Um, but being able to bring these projects in, even if it's just a few projects working together towards a few common goals is worth it. That doesn't mean that we should stop there, though. I, sometimes there is drama in the fig. I'm not going to pretend there isn't. I would be lying to you if I wasn't. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the fig is a bunch of people sitting around a table working out how they can work better together for the benefit of the PHP community, for, the, for their projects that they represent, and how they can make our language better place to be. Whether that's whether, whether you're working, for PHP, working with PHP in your day job, or whether or not you just do it for a hobby. They're working to try and make the PHP community better. And that's ultimately what it really comes down to. Together, the fig is starting to help make development easier, minimum friction between switching libraries, um, between using multiple frameworks and applications together. It's encouraging good practices. Um, it allow, allows projects to communicate a lot better. And it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to deal with so much uh, stuff that you don't want to have to deal with. Sometimes you have to fight tooth and nail for your, for your side. And we're trying to make that better. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to make it easier for community members to come up and start working on projects, uh, working on PSRs and stuff, because we want your, we want your feedback. Um, in the same way that we want projects like WordPress um, to come and say hello um, and see how, what we can do together. We're going to keep going, because bringing everyone under one roof allows the very split PHP ecosystem to come together um, for mutual benefit, because the FIG does great work. Um, and if you disagree with that statement, come and have a chat with me later, and um, we'll see if we still agree by the end of, uh, disagree by the end of it. It brings projects together, ecosystems can collide, and it promotes interoperability, collaboration, and good standards. And finally, I just want to finish on a quote by Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is a success. Thank you very much. I've got my slides up there, and depending on what the time is, um, a tweet might have just gone out with my slides as well. So um, thank you very much. Oh, uh, yeah, we can do questions if we've got time. Um, Joel, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I want a <laughs> question from Jeremy. Can I leave the room before you ask the question? Is your, is your last name pronounced Kolomuk? No, it's Michael. It's my, Michael Cullum, UK, because um, uh, Michael Cullum was taken by some person who, if I ever meet, I will not be very happy with. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's my Twitter handle, by the way. So if you hop on my Twitter, if you can't grab the link, um, then I've got my tweets up, my slides up there. Uh, Magnus, if you shout it out, I'll repeat it. Okay. I know that. So you mentioned an <laughs> impressive number of, of PRs to, to the FIG repository, I assume. How, in your estimate, how many of those approximately are about tabs versus spaces? Um, so those, that number was a, uh, a compilation of different uh, repositories. It wasn't just for the main FIG repository, because a lot of uh, P, um, projects are worked on separately. So um, async has their own organization stuff, so I included those numbers. Um, I would probably imagine about 5, 10, maybe, maybe 30. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a controversial topic. But frankly, um, if you don't have anything better to do than argue about spaces versus tabs, um, and start submitting pull requests. Like it doesn't actually matter. Like it doesn't affect your day-to-day -day life if you have tabs versus spaces. It just might make you feel better. Like I'm a tabs guy. It doesn't mean I don't use PSR two just because it, you know one thing bugs me. Like 
Uh, real question. In a quick summary, um, the discussion about there being a FIG 3.0, yeah. What, is, what is the goal of that and what will it help? Right, so FIG 3.0, um, I haven't really touched it on here because it hasn't been voted on yet. Um, the idea of FIG 3.0 is that uh, right now there is no community representation within the FIG at all. Um, you can contribute to the FIG for five years more than any other member project and you still don't have a vote. You can be the most intelligent person in the world and not have a vote. Um, and what this changes is that it um, has to, it will divide the fig into two, essentially. You'll have uh, a core committee um, who will be responsible for overall quality of the fig. Um, so they're responsible for, uh, once uh, a PSR is being worked on by this other group, um, they're a bunch of generalized individuals, so um, well-known uh, well or less well-known people that represent different interests. So maybe one person from a framework, um, one person from a library, one person from a more legacy project. Um, that represent, And their job is to then check the quality of the specification and kind of be the guardians of the fig. You then have the working groups. And the working groups is the most important change. So we've had in the past PSR 6, PSR 7, where important stakeholders were ignored. Um, or not necessarily ignored, but maybe their uh, concerns weren't addressed in the right way. Um, and sometimes people, like, and, and, and that can cause problems um, in terms of adoption. Um, this solves that problem by Instead of having every member project having an equal vote on everything, you only have a vote on what you're actually involved with. So if you're a caching library, you would have a vote on a caching uh, PSR. But if you're a um, logging library that never does any caching like Monolog, then you would have absolutely no say over that PSR. Um, and then the role of the core committee would be responsible for once that working group has approved a, a specification, um, then they would say, well, actually, looking at your working group, you're not including the two largest caching uh, libraries. Go and get them into the working group, take it back to the beginning, and get it working into a nice position. So you've got the right people working on the specifications. You've got the right people having a say and having a vote on those specifications. And then you've got that safeguarding, that final check to make sure that the right people have had an opinion on that specification. Brian? You? Um, <clears throat> what's your, what are you most excited about over the next Six months from, from the fig. What, what do I expect? Um, I would quite like, I, I imagine HTTP factories, HTTP middlewares are going to be quite quick. Um, so I might actually, we might even start to see them going into review. That would be really fab. Um, I am fig 3.0. Um, if it goes through, that will become a thing. Um, and I'd really like to see us start to um, actually focus, have a more outward looking uh, fig. So. At the moment, there is a perception, particularly if you frequent Reddit more than is healthy, um, that the PHP fig only discusses drama. And I want to move away from that. I want to try and uh, have less drama. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you have to talk about your own internals. Sometimes that's just a thing. But the fact is, is that it's, it's not right that the wider PHP community only views us for that. So providing people with regular updates as to what's going on with these, I mean, all, most of these specifications, you know, they're being worked on in, uh, by small groups of people. The wider community have no idea what's going on. So trying to tell you and trying to be better at inform informing the uh, wider community as to what's going on. Um, so I don't know, maybe something like blog posts, uh, giving updates more regularly and things like that. Um, because ultimately, then it means that you guys can get involved as well. PHP Cache, PSR 6, when it came out, um, as I said, uh, Tobias and Aaron were working on it in its SymphonyCon Berlin, uh, Paris, uh, back in December. And we discovered a couple of issues with PSR 6 um, that if we'd have found a few, weeks a few weeks earlier, then that might have been fixable, um, or if they'd known about that. But the fact is, is that because there was no public information side of the fig, um, and so my role kind of within the FIG now as a secretary, one of my roles is as a developer advocate together with uh, Samantha and uh, formerly Joe, who's just resigned as secretary. Um, but we'll be having new elections for other secretaries uh, in August. Um, I'm staying on. Uh, but essentially, we'll be fulfilling developer advocate roles. Um, so trying to get that information out. Any other questions? Don't be shy. If there's anyone up on the balcony, then... Uh, Awesome. Um, if anyone wants to have any other questions, I'm just come and have a chat with me. I'm more than happy to chat about PHP, BBB, FIG, um, user groups, uh, whatever else. So, yeah, thank you very much.